Well, hi everybody. Um, it's an honor to be sitting up here before you. And uh, it's something that I've wanted to do ever since I first was coming uh, as a volunteer at staff retreats and seeing people, you know, mostly tell their story back uh, back in those days. And I could just picture myself up here telling my story. And I love to talk about myself. And <laughs> And I was, that's why I like AA. I'm in AA, and I love to, to go up and tell my story in AA. And I always anticipated someday I'd be up here telling my story. But um, last year, Charlie did his talk on uh, the round of dependent origination. And uh, he really inspired me. And, and it made me really have a desire to give a regular, more typical Dharma talk. So I've attempted to do that. Um, a couple of things that have gotten in the way is I've been sick since last Thursday. And uh, I really intended to spend a lot of time preparing for this during the course of this retreat, and and I've been just too sick to do much of anything until this afternoon. Um, I'm feeling a lot better, and uh, and I don't know if my voice is going to last, and I don't know uh, if I'm going to last, um, but I think I will. And I don't know how long this talk is either. Um, so, <laughs> so you may be here a couple of hours, and it may be like 20 minutes. I'm not sure. I, my mind, one of the things is with the fever, my mind has really been funny. And uh, so I have no concept of how long it's going to be. But I have an idea if it, if it runs too short, I, I, I know something fun we could try. Um, <laughs> uh, so what I chose to talk about is um, one of the suttas. It's called uh, the Burning Sutta, or sometimes referred to as the Fire Sermon. And it's in, um, it's in the Connected Discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, in the section on the six sense bases, which is known as the Salayatana Samyutta, uh, the six senses. Um, and it's, uh, the, the name in Pali of the sutta is the Ati, At, Aditapariyaya Sutta. Uh, fire sermon's easier to say. Um, and there's a few reasons why I was inspired by this. Um, it's something I read. It's actually in Jack Cornfield's little little tiny book on the teachings of the Buddha. And um, and I saw it there. And then uh, and then something else happened. Was um, last year, maybe two years ago, Daniel and I wanted to do a skit for for a coffee house. And uh, what we were going to do was copy word for word a Monty Python skit. But we went through the DVDs of every single Monty Python episode and couldn't find a single one we agreed was the right one to do. So just out of nowhere, it came to me, let's take one of these really repetitious suttas of the Buddhas and, and, and do that. And, and we came up, and some of you were there and saw what we did with it. It was a lot of fun. And um, I don't know why it, it, that, that particular sutta showed up for me, but it was a perfect one for what we were doing. Um, I really like this because it reminds me of like these old time southern preachers. Um, there's a lot of fire and brimstone and, and salvation in it. And, uh, and so that's one of the things that I really like. I don't know why I like that kind of sermon. And I, you know, I haven't seen one live. I've only seen them in movies and stuff. But I really like the way the, the sutta reads when, uh, when you go through it. Um, so historically, this is actually the third sermon that the, that the Buddha taught. Um, it was a couple of months after his awakening. And um, he delivered it to a thousand newly converted bhikkhus, uh, people that were formerly fire worshippers. And, and their, um, their, their religion, if you will, was worshipping fire. And they had a lot of different activities they did around fire. And they had converted to the, to the Buddha's teachings. And, uh, and he had to address them, and he thought, what, how, should I, you know, how should I address these people that they'll, that they'll learn and, and become awakened? And, um, and so he decided to use the analogy of the fire. Um, and uh, Anyway, what I'll do is, uh, it's very repetitious. I won't go through the whole thing the way I did during the coffee house, but, um, but I'll go through part of it and explain how it repeats. And, uh, so it reads this way. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Gaia, at Gaia's head, together with a thousand bhikkhus. The Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, all is burning. And what bhikkhus is, all, is the all that is burning? The eye is burning, forms are burning, eye consciousness is burning, eye contact is burning, and whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, that too is burning. Burning with what? 
burning with the fire of lust, the fire of hatred, the fire of delusion, burning with birth, aging, and death, with sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, I say. And he goes through each of the six sense bases. After, after the eye, he does the ear is burning, the nose is burning, the tongue is burning, the body is burning, and finally the mind is burning. Mental phenomena are burning, mind consciousness is burning, mind contact is burning. Whatever feeling arises with mind contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion. Burning with birth, aging, and death, with sorrow, lamentation, and pain, displeasure, and despair, I say. And, uh, and so then he says, seeing thus, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion towards the eye, revulsion towards forms, towards eye consciousness, towards eye contact, towards whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, experiences revulsion towards the ear, towards the nose, towards the tongue, towards the body, and towards the mind. And experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. And through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. He understands, destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. And what had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. That is what the Blessed One said. Elated, those bhikkhus delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while the discourse was being spoken, the minds of those thousand bhikkhus were liberated from the taints by non-clinging. I just love that phrase. Um, the knowledge he has is uh, destroyed his birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for the state of being. So there's some pretty strong words in there. Um, burning and revulsion. Um, but the outcome is Nibbana for the thousand bhikkhus. You know, um, when I first read this, this was a long time ago that I first read it in the, in, the little, in the little book of the Buddha's teachings. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty strong. You know, um, I'm a person who delights in sense pleasures. I don't know about anybody else, but <laughs> I like them. And, uh, <laughs> and the Sutta seems to be taking, wanting to take something away from me there. And um, I'm like, I just couldn't see developing revulsion towards the sense of pleasures. And, uh, and they didn't always feel like they were burning to me either. Um, <laughs> but I continued to practice. And, um, and I would often hear like less intense discussion around the same topic. You know, I, I had heard plenty of times that the root of our suffering is, is desire and anger and delusion and and I could kind of see it happening in some ways, you know, but I never heard, um, I, and I heard a lot of talks, you know, I went, I've gone on a lot of retreats and, um, and since I've been here, I go to a lot of talks when I'm not on retreat and, uh, I've never heard a teacher give a talk on this sutta. And, and I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty stark and it's, and, and it can be kind of depressing to, to hear it. So that maybe that's why, mm. but, um, uh, Anyway, the Buddha is covering everything that we experience in connection with all six sense bases. Basically, that's the totality of our experience. Everything that we experience is something to do with one of the six sense bases, whether it's the, the five physical ones or the mind. And he's talking about them being on fire and burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion. And he's talking about developing a revulsion towards them. And... Um, that's, that's pretty strong medicine. Um, he does put a happy ending on it in the sutta. You know, everybody gets enlightened. But, uh, but the way they do it is by developing revulsion to these things that I know many of us hold so dear. And I, especially me. I mean, I'm, I'm like a glutton for sense pleasure. I, I think I might have said that. Um, <laughs> so... Who wants to experience revulsion towards a beautiful sunset or an eggplant parmesan dinner or, uh, or the touch of our lover? You know, it's, it's a tough one. And um, the word revulsion has some play in it. I, I was able to find a few different translations of this. And um, Bhikkhu Bodhi uses the word revulsion in, um, in his 
in his uh, translation of the Connected Discourses, but um, actually in his, uh, his kind of uh, collection of works uh, in the Buddha's words where he takes discourses from a couple of different places, he has the same sutta in here and he uses a different translation. He, um, he says, develops uh, dis or becomes disenchanted with so um, there's a, another way to look at it. And also, um, Thanissaro Bhikkhu uses grows disenchanted with, and Nyanamoli Thera uses the phrase finds estrangement in. So there's a few different translations, um, but either way, it's basically telling us to let go of these, uh, these you know, feelings arising through the, through the sense bases. Um, now, it might be easier to get our minds around how sense contact leading to painful feelings is burning, and, and we probably don't mind so much growing disenchanted with, uh, with those feelings. But not always. I mean, there's many in our world, and, um, and probably at least I know of one in this room, that, that delight in their anger sometimes. Um, often anger that they feel is justified. Um, I myself have spent good parts of sittings with my mind burning with fire of hatred over things that certain political figures might be doing or certain baseball teams might be doing, <laughs> various things. And, you know, and, and in the moment, I'm quite enchanted with that, that line of thinking. Um, so, um, so why did the Buddha have such a strong point to make about our contact with the world through the sense basis? Um, the Sutta runs fairly parallel to the description of dependent origination, which describes how we're kept in the wheel of samsara through rebirth after rebirth. Uh, dependent origination, just to, you know, very briefly, he says that ignorance gives rise to volitional formations, which give rise to consciousness. Consciousness, uh, consciousness gives rise to nama rupa, which can variously be translated as mind and body or name and form mentality, materiality, and nama rupa gives rise to the six sense doors. Um, so that's where this sutta comes in. The six sense doors give rise to contact. And what contact is in a Buddhist sense is um, the coming together of three things, the sense door with the sense object and the sense consciousness. So in the case of the eye, it's the eye coming in contact with, with sense object like a form in sense consciousness, the awareness of, of the vision. Um, and what the Buddha said was, with contact, the whole world arises. Um, so anyway, contact gives rise to feeling, feeling here being the pleasant, the painful, or the neither painful nor pleasant. And feeling um, that arises uh, gives, gives rise next to craving, um, often for something pleasant, but it could be craving to, to be rid of something unpleasant. Um, or craving for something different to happen in the case of, uh, of a neutral feeling. And craving gives rise to clinging. And clinging gives rise to birth, and birth gives rise to aging and death, and it, and it all starts over again. And uh, so it's in how we deal with, with the sense doors and contact um, that really we have the most control of the level of suffering in our lives, and uh, this life and, and whatever lives may be coming next. Um, if we want to get, if we give in to the burning, then craving arises and it leads to clinging and sure enough suffering. And um, I, I wonder if there's anyone that hasn't experienced that. Um, you can raise your hand or no. Okay, so um, I have experienced it. I know that. Um, but if we're able to become disenchanted with experience at the sense doors, then craving and clinging don't have to arise and lead to suffering. And that's um, basically our ticket out, from my understanding. Um, last year, when Charlie was given this talk on dependent origination, that time my mind was really on fire, and it was burning with, with the fire of desire. And I remember vividly, I was sitting down in this corner here and hearing him talk about this. And I had heard the story of dependent origination before, but in the midst of my suffering, it wasn't what was coming to my mind. But I remember him talking, and, and I just saying to myself, yeah, that's what's happening here. Sense door, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, suffering. It was so clear that that was what was driving me crazy in that moment. And, um, and you know, there was a little bit of disenchantment came with seeing that. But, um, 
but it's a tough road. And I know by, by a couple of days later, I was just as deep into my suffering as I had been before that. And, you know, it's hard to become disenchanted with something that's, that's really burning. Um, another way I've seen in, in the suttas that the Buddha talks about um, something similar to this, um, you see it frequently in the suttas, is when he talks about the gratification, the danger, and the escape. And um, I've seen it in numerous places, but uh, just I'll give you a brief synopsis. Um, you know, he says that before he was enlightened, he asked these questions. What is the gratification in the world? What is the danger in the world? And what is the escape from the world? And it occurred to him, whatever pleasure and joy there is in the world, this is the gratification. That is, the world is that the world is impermanent and bound up in suffering and subject to change. This is the danger. And that the removal and abandoning of desire and lust for the world, this is the escape from the world. And he says when he understood this completely, he, he could say that he had achieved the perfect enlightenment. So it's that gratification that, that is actually the burning to me. It's like, it's that seeing something so desirable that my mind just burns with, with, with desire for it. And, and that gratification is dangerous. I mean, it's like, even if I get it, I know I'm not going to be satisfied. Part of me knows that the whole time. And, uh, and especially after I get it, I realize that I'm not satisfied. And, um, and it's because things are impermanent. Nothing, there's no object of my desire that I can get that's going to bring lasting happiness. And that's the danger. They're impermanent. And, um, and really the solution is, is um, the escape. It's, it's to abandon the, that lust and desire for these objects. So the wording still sounds a little harsh to me. But I, I can look back on my experience and recall times where burning would be an apt description for my essential experience. Um, you know, for me, the one sense that comes to mind the most is the mind itself. Um, you know, a lot of times it's tied to visual cues, but it's, it's the mind where the story really gets going and rolling and building, uh, burning from like a little campfire into a bonfire or an inferno. And um, me being more highly moved by greed and desire than aversion or hatred or confusion, uh, the examples that come to my mind are mostly around desire. And going back, uh, the one thing that I thought of that, that goes back the longest in my life was waiting for Christmas morning. And, and I can remember, like, as a kid, just that was, like, the best day of the year was Christmas. And, and I can remember, like, my sister and I had bedrooms um, separate rooms where the doors were near each other and we could talk to each other at night through the doors and we would just talk about what we were going to get for Christmas and you know it's eight more days it's seven more days and we just couldn't wait for that Christmas morning and it was just it was the burning was in us and um, you know and for for a while I think we felt pretty satisfied on those Christmas mornings you know mostly toys some clothes but mostly toys and <laughs> you know and eventually, I remember there coming a year where there was a bunch of toys, but um, but they were all open and sitting on the floor and looking around and feeling like, ah, there's not enough here, or this 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 isn't good enough. Then and it was like this real empty feeling, and um, you know, there's the danger. It's like I couldn't be satisfied by that, and. Uh, you know, as I got older, um, at some point I developed an interest in cars, and I remember I had a, I had a car that my my parents gave me to go off to college with, and and I wrecked it, and they had agreed that they were going to buy me a new car um, to go back to college the next year. And at this time, it was um, it was the early '80s, and like the Camaros and the Firebirds of the late '70s were these long, sleek, low to the ground cars, really. You know, uh, I think Freud would say they're phallic symbols, basically. But uh, but they were these really cool cars, and I was dying to have a Camaro or a Firebird. And uh, my parents were looking at darts, and um, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know what else. But uh, they certainly didn't want to get me a muscle car, and I was just—I could picture myself driving that Camaro, leaning back in the seat, and burning rubber all over campus and stuff, and. I was going to be so cool. I mean, I was already cool, but <laughs> this was going to top it off. And, um, you know, and I just, I was burning for, for this car. And, you know, 
it ended up they bought me a car which was really a sleeper and a very cool car and I didn't I didn't appreciate it at the time but they got me a Dart Sport with a V8 engine and uh, anyway I, I liked it but it, it wasn't what I had wanted um, you know about that time I started going to see the Grateful Dead and um, the first time they came around I went to one show and then the next fall they came I went to one show and then spring I went to a show and then fall I went to two shows and spring I went to two shows and then I think I went to five shows the next tour and, and I would call into their hotline to find out how to order tickets and they would uh, give you the instructions and they would say you know write down how many tickets to each show you want on the outside of your envelope or write tour book and the tour book was one ticket to every show on the whole tour I'm like tour book <laughs> tour, I could get a tour book I could go to every show on the east coast and like, and I'm in college, you know, and I'm like, I spent five and a half years in college the first time because of going to a lot of dead shows and stuff like that. And, um, and I would hear people tell stories of like, oh yeah, he quit his job to follow the dead. And like, I'm like, wow, that guy must be cool. <laughs> but I had some sensibility in me and I never quit my job or, or dropped out of school to follow the dead. And I think I went to seven shows on a tour was the most I had done. Um, so I never got a tour book, but like, I remember that the same thing was going on, the burning, the desire to be at the show. And, and at one point, um, I repeated the thing of Christmas morning and I was just, I had my tickets all ready and I was just waiting and waiting and waiting for the first show of the tour. And, couldn't, and that's all I was thinking about all the time was how great it was going to be to get to that show. And, um, and the show came and went so fast and I didn't even notice it. And like, I was, I was left down and, you know. I had no practice, I had no knowledge of the Dharma, but I did have a little insight and I, I realized, like, don't look forward to shows anymore because it was a real letdown and, and uh, you know, there was a little bit of insight there and uh, after that I never did look forward to shows and I enjoyed them a lot more, but um, I never went to one that satisfied completely and, and, uh, and I still, you know, I don't still, I still don't expect to. Um, an example that happened uh, a few years later was, um, you know, back in 1993, I thought I was probably going to get married to this woman I was with, and um, and we broke up kind of unexpectedly, and uh, she broke up with me, obviously, or it wouldn't have been unexpected, but, um, <laughs> you know, after a year, I got into this horrendous bounce-back relationship, and it was just an insanity relationship, and... Um, and it was get together, break up, get together, break up. And like, I was like turned into complete mush in my head by this relationship. And, and I was going to um, see a couple of dead shows in Chicago with my friend. And um, so at this time we were broken up again. And, uh, and I went to Chicago with my friend Bob. And um, it was the middle of summer. It was July and it was so hot. And um, where they were playing Soldier's Field is right near... Um, the, the Great Lake up there and like all around that area is just all these parking lots where all the deadheads were parked and people sell stuff and it's a whole scene outside those shows and and it was hot and there was millions, it seemed like millions, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of young people there wearing hardly any clothes and, and a lot of them were really beautiful women and uh, and I remember just walking through these parking lots and my eyes were on fire. I mean. It was weird. I had read, you know, I had never done any practice yet, but I had read some Buddhism by this point, and, um, and I had learned about how they said that, that this is suffering, and I could see this is suffering. Like, I would look at these beautiful women, and I was such a head case from this relationship that even if I wanted to try to, to, to pick up somebody or something like that, I couldn't even talk to them. I was just like a mess, and um, all I could do was walk around, and I hope to this day that my tongue was in my mouth here, but... <laughs> I was just walking around and seeing all this this beautiful sensuality around me and and I was burning I mean and it was painful I could feel the pain in there and um you know it was true I it's definitely I, the senses were burning and if I could have developed this enchantment at that point in time I would have loved to have um an example that shows uh, some aversion that came to my mind was um you know back in the 80s uh I had gotten really 
upset about some politics and and um and one of the big things was the illegal war that the u.s was waging on the sandinista government in nicaragua you know i had learned some stuff about it and i knew that we were doing a lot of stuff that was illegal and and even if it was illegal it was still totally wrong and immoral and i was i was just filled with hatred at, at our government and with ronald reagan and george bush about this whole thing and um you know, and I was a big drinker back then, and uh, and so I was going home for Christmas Christmas holidays one year, and um, I brought this kid. This kid I was visiting from England, and he was working in the company I worked at. And he had nothing to do for Christmas, so I brought this guest with me home. You know, on Christmas Eve, I, was, I just started drinking, and um, and I don't even know why I was arguing with my parents about it because they didn't like um, the government either that much, but. Uh, Somehow I was rallying about how evil our government was, and I just made the biggest, most horrendous scene that you could possibly imagine. And, you know, my poor friend was there, and he witnessed it, and I really ruined Christmas for all of us. And it was just that fire. The mind was on fire with, 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 um, with hatred, and, oh, it was terrible. Um, you know, and I still think that... My my attitudes about what the government was doing were were correct, but you know my my way of approaching it was was completely wrong and and anything but productive. Um, so um, so anyway, I, when I was looking at this, um, I was looking online for common theories on this sutta, and I actually had a hard time finding much of anything. But there was there was a blog, and somebody called Read the Suttas points out that the senses and objects, etc., are burning, not the fire. They're the fuel for the fire. And what he said was, um, and this makes sense to me, is uh, that it's our enchantment with the fire that's, that's, actually, um, that's actually the burning and that's the suffering. And uh, indeed, it's the enchantment that makes me pursue these ends that I've been taught over and over again have no power to satisfy. And, you know, and I know it for myself after I've come through it that they don't have the power to satisfy, but... Um, but I don't know. I, there's something. It's it's just like I said in my poem I read the other day. Um, I began to believe it could be different this round. That's where Mara gets you. You know, it's like always this fire comes up again, and I said, oh, maybe this is different than that. And anyway, um, so it isn't that we can't have pleasant and unpleasant and neutral feelings in regard to our sense bases. Um, in fact, it's impossible not to have that happen. Um, in the wind, it says directly that um, that with the contact comes feeling, and so those feelings are going to arise no matter what. It's what we do in in uh, in reaction to the feelings that makes the difference. Um, and if we're able to become disenchanted with them, then we have a chance of stepping off that wheel, at least for for that little piece of our life. Um, in our culture, we're taught anything but to be disenchanted with pleasant feelings. You know, there's huge industries out there bombarding us with messages all day long, every day, trying to get us enchanted with their product or with whatever it is that they that they want to sell us, and um, you know, or or something that they want us to to rally against. Um, so we're up against it, especially in in uh, in Western culture. But um, I think one thing that threw me when I first read the Sutta in my mind was that I thought it implied that I had to renounce all my wonderful burning sense experiences right away. And, um, and you know, maybe that's not the case, you know. Uh, it's kind of similar to a fear I had when, when I knew my drinking was out of control. Um, I knew for a while that, that I was an alcoholic and that my drinking was causing me a lot of problems. And... Um, and yet, like, what I imagined was I had to um, quit drinking and drop the only fun thing I had in my life and for the rest of my life and just live a boring, monotonous life forever on then. And, um, and I was really afraid of doing that. It was not what I had in mind, you know. And, uh, and at some point, I got to the point where I said, yeah, that would be worth it more than waking up with these hangovers and getting in trouble and spending all my money. And so I actually tried to get sober and I discovered that I didn't have to drop every fun thing in life, that there's actually a lot of fun things in life without um, drinking involved. And, um, and that's the miracle of my sobriety, and I haven't had a drink since um, 1989. Um, but, so when I think about this, does it mean that I have to drop all these, um, these wonderful burning sensations, you know, and like, 
And they say, I'm going to be just this boring, you know, I might as well be a monk, I guess, you know. Uh, <laughs> eat oatmeal with no sugar and, <laughs> like, no pleasant, no painful, no neutral. And no, it's not like that. I mean, um, for one thing, there's, there's, there's actually joy and in insight, you know. There's, there's joy when you realize that, that you don't have to chase after the things that, that, that ultimately fit to satisfy. And, I'm certainly not an expert on this. Um, I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, you know, I know that uh, that there's a lot of higher joys than than the joys of just pleasant sensual feelings. Um, so, um, so it may be that the path to nibbana is paved this way, and I don't want to discount like total disenchantment here and now. If 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 I was able to do it and I was motivated, I hope I would try to do that. But um. I don't think that, for me, I'm able to do it at this point in this lifetime. Um, and, you know, what? I was looking at some of those translations, and perhaps what it's being pointed to is more a path of disenchantment. You know, if we say instead of, um, instead of experiences revulsion towards, um, if we use the, uh, the translation that was becomes just enchanted with, you know, that implies a path. It's not like all of a sudden, that's it, I'm disenchanted. It's... You know, I, I go out to a movie, and the movie's lousy because they don't make good movies anymore. And and then the next time Dan says, let's go to this movie, I just say, you know, I'm disenchanted. <laughs> and, and and I found that's and it's an example. That's a real example. Because, you know, it used to be every time somebody was going to go out to the movies, I said, all right, we'll go, we'll drive out here, we'll spend our 10 bucks, we'll buy some crappy food while we're there, we'll... <laughs> You know, do this. They won't let you bring in your water. And <clears throat> and then we'll see this terrible movie with nothing but lots of explosions and violence and, you know, you name it. And and not even very clever script. And, and then we'll go home and we'll have wasted an evening, you know. And and I've I've found, like, it's possible to, to become disenchanted with some things like that. Um, maybe even revulsion in some cases. <laughs> um and there's other things, uh, you know, going out in general, it used to be like, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to go out and go dancing or stuff like that. And, you know, it's not like I'm against dancing. I would go out dancing anytime, but, um, but it's not like I have to do it anymore. And, uh, so, you know, for me, I spent a lot of years following the Grateful Dead and, um, and the remaining members just put tickets on sale yesterday and, you know, and I'm, I'm working part time while I'm on this retreat. So I knew I was going to be at the computer when the when the clock struck and you could start ordering tickets and uh and and I couldn't get through and couldn't get through and I finally got through and all they had left was lousy seats and they wanted like sixty seven dollars behind the stage or a hundred dollars for like rafters anywhere else in the building and uh and they only had single tickets and I, and I had them in the shopping cart and I'm like, well at least I'll be in and it's just like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend a hundred dollars to sit in a lousy seat and see a band. You know, even if it is my favorite band. And um, so I closed the browser and I didn't buy the tickets. Um, and they go on sale to the public in a couple of weeks and I'll try again. Because, I mean, I would like to go, but I, I'm not willing to just, like, take lousy seats and <laughs> pay $100. So, um, anyway, um, sometimes when I look on a beautiful scene like Gaston Pond in the spring... You know, I'm able to just look at it and absorb it and, and, and not have to, like, hold it all into myself. Or, or Sometimes I can really just look at it with, with neither enchantment nor disenchantment, I guess. I mean, it's hard to say disenchanted because it's very beautiful. But other times I'll go out there, and this is what happened when I was on retreat last spring, is I'll see how beautiful it is, and I'll rush back to my room and get my camera and my lenses and go out and take pictures of the frogs and the salamanders and the flowers and... Maybe I put them in the e-bulletin or maybe even the newsletter and like, you know, and the mind gets going and going in the middle of the retreat and, you know, it's, it's dukkha. But, um, you know, it's a slow process. Um, I think the sutta does hold some value for me in the here and now because especially in those times when the burning is most intense and I could feel it and, and sometimes it feels like pain rather than just like, oh, this pleasant thing, if I can just have this pleasant thing. Sometimes I'll think, like, this is burning, and, and it'll help me to just step back from that for a second and, uh, and let go a little. And, uh, and maybe, 
you know, recall times where I've had a similar burning and, and not gotten, you know, or, or what the result of that has been. And uh, so I think, um, I think in that sense, uh, and even though I still have a long way to go before burning leads directly to disenchantment all the time, you know, it's working on me a little. Um, so that's what I had to say about this. And uh, it looks like I did come out a little short. And, you know, all week I've been, like, sick, and my mind hasn't been functioning that well. And, uh, and I was thinking, I'm never going to be able to finish this. I had this idea. I wanted to do this really scholarly, dominant talk. And... And I'm thinking, well, maybe if I can't do that, I'll just tell my story and I'll do the Dharma talk next year. But no, I want to do it this year. And well, maybe I'll talk about being sick. And um, and I shared this in, in our interview group this afternoon uh, or this morning. It was, um, you know, being stuck on retreat. I've been on, I think, something like 22, 23 retreats before. And this is the first time I've ever gotten sick on retreat. And, uh, you know, all in all, I've been blessed with incredibly good health. Um, for as long as I can remember, I guess I was kind of sick as a baby, I'm told. But, but as long as I can remember, I've, I've never been to a hospital except to get stitches once, and I've never had any real serious illnesses. And, and so I'm incredibly blessed, and, and I know that. But just the same, when I get sick, I am a baby. And, like, I've been a baby all week. And, um, and like, I remember the first, over the weekend, when I was really just feverish, just thinking to myself, it sucks to be mindful when you're sick. You know, it really does, because, like, I couldn't breathe through my nose, and every breath I took through my mouth would, like, dry out my mouth, and then I'd have to swallow, and then, like, the swallow would hurt my throat, and then I'd have to breathe again, and, like, I'd breathe, and I couldn't breathe through my nose still, so I'd have to breathe through my mouth, and trying to sleep like that, and then the thoughts coming up, like, I'm not going to be able to sleep. How can I sleep if I don't sleep? You know, it's good. I have to get up in the morning. How can I get up in the morning if I don't sleep? And, uh, you know, and, and like, just, and, like, oh, I wish I wasn't mindful. I wish I could just drop out of this. I wish I could go somewhere. Like, where could I go? You know, I could go home. The cat's not going to feed me. At least they feed me here, you know. And, <clears throat> and, and there was nothing to do except to go through it. But it occurred to me at one point that, um, and this kind of relates to something I learned from Steve Armstrong, like, because I used to think, what, I had like a lot of thinking going on in a retreat I sat with him, and he pointed out that at any moment, there's only one thing happening in the mind. You know, I thought, well, what do you mean? I'm listening to a song, and I'm thinking about this girl, and I'm thinking about my yogi job, and he goes, no, you're in flashing between all those things, but only one of them's happening at any moment in the mind. And, um, and I got to thinking about my symptoms, and... Uh, and I realized that at any moment I could only be aware of one of the symptoms. And I started going through them. And, and like, I know for me what I was having was fogginess due to the fever and sore lungs due to the coughing and somewhat of a sore throat due, due to the coughing and a stuffed up nose congestion and body aches and occasionally a little queasiness. And that's, that's the total of all the symptoms I had at different times. And, and I started doing like a symptom scan. And, um, and I would say, all right, well, not their fogginess right now. No? Okay. Is, does the lung hurt? Well, the lung only hurts when I'm coughing, so it's not really hurting. And I just saw a bit my cheek on the first night of the retreat, and it got infected. And as it gets infected, it gets bigger, and it's easier to bite, you know. And so, but like, well, is that hurting right now? No, it's not hurting right now. I'm not biting it. And I would go through these, and I'd go, well, wait a minute. Right now, none of those symptoms are actually being felt. And like, what am I complaining about? And so, um, so I don't know, how many people have been sick on this retreat? Can I? Quite, a, quite a few. So I'm sorry, because I know how it feels. But I would just like to encourage everybody maybe to take a couple of minutes and um, close your eyes and, and relax a little. And if you could breathe through your nose, do that. If, if not, breathe through your mouth, um, whatever works. And, um, and just... Think of your list of, of symptoms and, and do a scan and see if they're arising right now. And
So how was that? I notice right now I don't have any of the symptoms except maybe a little bit of a sweat and that's probably from sitting up here in front of y'all. But um, the other symptom that I forgot to mention was my story about my sickness. And that's the one that I discovered was the problem. Because in any moment, even if one of those symptoms was present, like even if, even if the lung was hurting or even if I had just bit down on that, that sore again, you know, it was, I'm sick, I'm sick on retreat. I'm sick and I have to be mindful of it. You know, that was where the suffering was. It wasn't, it wasn't like these individual symptoms. Even the ones that were there weren't all that bad if I could just stay with them in the present moment. And, um, you know, I'm sure this is something that, that, that millions of meditators have discovered long before me, but I felt like a genius when I found this. <laughs> I have to tell you, and, and, it, and I really didn't get much of a sense of it until the sickness had peaked, you know, it kind of peaked yesterday, and um, it's almost like I wish I was still in the worst part of it to see if it would really work. <laughs> I'm not going to really uh, intentionally wish that on myself, and I'll hopefully remember this the next time I get sick, because as the Buddha said, we are going to get sick. Um, so anyway, I want to thank everybody for listening, and um, we'll do some walking meditation.